two of the three fundamental mysteries about our place in the universe have already been solved. The first was literally about our place in the universe. This is a, a photograph taken by Voyager 1 on its journey out of the solar system from a distance of about, I think, six billion uh, kilometers. And all of human history, in fact, all of the history of life on this planet took place on that pale blue dot. That's the famous pale blue dot photo. That's the Earth from far away. Now, this just emphasizes the point that we've known since Copernicus that we are not at the center of the universe. We're just a tiny speck suspended somewhere out there in the abyss. You know, we're not so central. The second mystery is about our relationship to other forms of life. And Darwin pointed out that, again, we're not so special. We're related to all other creatures. And we're just uh, some branch or some twig of a beautifully rich and delicate evolutionary tree sharing much of the machinery of life with even uh, the simplest of our fellow creatures. And the third mystery is the mystery of our inner universe. And that's the mystery of consciousness. Now consciousness, for me, has always been absolutely fascinating. It's the one thing that cannot be an illusion. We could be mistaken about everything else. We could be mistaken about the existence of the external world at all, what it's made of, whether it's there. I could be mistaken. I could even be mistaken about, you know, not wanting Brexit to happen. But you know, I could be mistaken <laughs> about st things that's so fundamental, but I can't be mistaken about the fact that right now I'm having a conscious experience. <laughs> People might want to question that, but we'll hold questions at the end. Um, if you disagree with that, we'll, we'll be in trouble. I mean, I think... Um, um, <laughs> Well, I'm glad about that. Even if it's see, but you'd be surprised actually that that quite a number of philosophers have spent a lot of ink trying to argue that we can be mistaken about the fact that we are conscious, um, which I think goes down as one of the the sort of silliest sort of forms of philosophy that, that I've come across. And, you know, we even if it seems like we're conscious, that's enough. We have a. I don't know whether you are, but I certainly know that I am conscious right now. How does this happen? This is another of the central mysteries that we face. And it's similar to the other mysteries in the sense that it's challenging in some way our perceived importance in the universe, which is one reason, I think, this is something to bear in mind through the talk. This is one reason why people are often resistant to a scientific account of consciousness, because just like Copernicus, just like Darwin, it sort of naturalizes what we find most special about ourselves. And some people don't like that. And I think by the end of the talk, I'll hope to convince you that that's not something to be worried about. It's something we should uh, rejoice in. But this is the third mystery. How does consciousness happen? You know, somehow, within each of our brains, the combined activity of many billions of neurons is giving rise to a conscious experience. And not just any experience, your experience right here <coughs> and right now. How does this happen? Why is life in the first person? So the brain is a really remarkable object. If there's anything that's going to do something remarkable, maybe it's the brain. It's not so much the number of neurons. There are about 88 billion at the last count. It's not even really the number of connections, though there are so many connections in the brain that if you counted one every second, it would take you about 3 million years to finish counting. It's more the intricate patterns of connectivity that are still not fully known, but within which are inscribed everything that makes you, you. Now, you'll sometimes hear, and I often hear, that we know nothing about how the brain and body give rise to consciousness, that there's this uncrossable explanatory gap between conscious experience and the physical world. The origin of this view is often traced to Descartes, who back in the, in the Enlightenment, some hundreds of years ago, he divided the universe into two things. On the one side, there's res extensa, the stuff that things are made of, material stuff, the stuff that tables, chairs are made of, the stuff that bodies and indeed brains are also made of. And on the other side, there's res cogitans, the stuff of thought, um, of the realm of the mental and the realm of conscious experience. And by dividing the universe into this way, he generated the problem of how you put them back together again, uh, the philosophy of dualism, and nothing was ever uh, the same or simple since then. And Descartes' own preferred solution, some of you may have heard, was the pineal gland. The pineal gland is this part of the brain, deep in the middle of it, 
that was supposed to be this interface between these two realms of existence. Um, now, this is a kind of a strange idea. Certainly, the pineal gland is reasonably important, but it's not the seat of the soul. Probably the reason Descartes chose it was that unlike most parts of the brain, there's only one of them because it's right in the middle. Most of our brain is sort of, you know, we have left and right hemispheres. You find structures on both sides. So if you're looking for a place where one realm of the universe interfaces with another, it's sort of parsimonious to only have one of them rather than two. Uh, but that's probably the only good reason, if it's a good reason, for the pineal gland. Um, but this view then that, uh, this dualistic view that on the one hand you have consciousness and mind, on the other hand you have physical material, this has persisted in science and more latterly in psychology and neuroscience for a very long time. I started my undergraduate in the early 90s and just before I started, um, fortunately I didn't read this at the time, in the International Dictionary of Psychology, the International Dictionary of Psychology, Stuart Sutherland, who is the founding professor of psychology at my current University of Sussex, said this. He said, consciousness is a fascinating but elusive phenomenon. It's impossible to specify what it is, what it does, or why it evolved. <laughs> Nothing worth reading has been written on it. <laughs> this is quite a depressing state of affairs. Uh, to be sort of canonized into the, in the dictionary of psychology. But this indeed was, was the environment at the time. I mean, I remember studying psychology and neuroscience in the early 90s in, in Cambridge, and it was really not allowed to discuss consciousness. You know, maybe you could talk about memory and attention, uh, and perception, but not consciousness. That's philosophy or religion. Um, this is another, these, these cartoons, I, I'm very grateful to Jolyon Trishanko, who's done all these beautiful cartoons about neuroscience. This is another sort of idea about the impossibility of saying anything sensible about consciousness. That you can talk about, and maybe hopefully, hopefully this won't happen by the end of this talk, um, but you, know, you can have somebody talk about as, as much about neurons as they want, but there will still be some magic process by which it all alchemically is transformed into the redness of red or the sharpness of a pain or the actual experience of what, you know, the, the fundamental nature of a conscious experience. And I'm not saying this mystery has gone away at all. Um, but what I want to convey during this talk is that we shouldn't worry too much about uh, this mystery, about how consciousness, you know, why it's part of our universe in the first place, so long as we can do a good job of explaining its properties scientifically. Um, and in, indeed, this is, you know, the times have changed, and over the last 25 years, there's been a, a rehabilitation, a resurgence, and now first a trickle, and now quite a deluge of scientific work on consciousness. This is uh, my lab from a year or two ago. If you come to my lab and many others around, you find scientists of all different disciplines. The intro Niall said it nicely in the introduction. I mean, we work with uh, physicists, mathematicians, virtual reality engineers, neuroscientists, psychiatrists, and philosophers, all trying to understand how consciousness works and, and what happens when it goes wrong get to this at the end, but studying consciousness is not only interesting because it's one of the greatest remaining mysteries, it's also, I believe, of enormous practical importance for the insights it can give us into uh, things like depression, other psychiatric um, disorders, which uh, for, the, for the moment, for the most part, don't benefit from a very rich mechanistic understanding of what's going on in the same way that other branches of medicine do. Um, philosophy. Um, and the approach that we take, and the approach I want to argue for today, is to treat uh, consciousness a little bit like life. Now, this is an, an analogy that's been used many times. It's an imperfect analogy, but I think it's still valuable. Now, it wasn't that long ago that eminent <laughs> biochemists thought that life could never be explained in terms of mere mechanism that how much you understood about a material system, there was something special, very special about living systems that required some special source, some elan vital, some spark of life, that would account for the difference between the animate and the inanimate. But as biologists got on with the job of accounting for the properties of living systems, things like metabolism, reproduction and homeostasis, in terms of physics and chemistry, the basic mystery of what life is started to fade away. Now, we don't understand everything about life. People don't really know how a cell works. 
But this basic metaphysical sense of the unknown, that, we, that, that life is in principle beyond mechanistic explanation, now that has faded away. People no longer think that that mystery is as mysterious as it once was. And the hope is that, as with life, the same thing uh, will happen with consciousness. That as we start to account for its properties in terms of things happening inside brains and bodies, the basic mystery of what consciousness is will also start to fade away and people will worry about it less. And the reason I, th I mean, I'll give you some examples of how this is actually happening. Uh, but then, and I'll return at the end, I think, to some of the ways in which people still resist this, this approach. Why do we still think there's something, you know, there's going to be some residue left? I mean, if you think about it, even physics. Physics is probably the, the best example of a science that's able to shed enormous insight into the way things are in, in ways that are very counterintuitive, but also very predictive, very explanatory. But physics still doesn't tell us why there is a universe versus not. It's still, you know, we don't really know what matter is. There are still some basic things in the domain of physics that remain mysterious, but that hasn't stopped physics revealing a great deal about the nature of the world we live in, and I think the same uh, will turn out to be true um, for consciousness. Now, there's another way to put this, which I want to flag, um, since some of you may have heard of this, and this is a, sort of the, the, the more recent incarnation of the Cartesian divide, this divide into res extensa and res cogitans. This is between what people have been calling, uh, following the Australian philosopher David Chalmers, the easy problem and the hard problem. How many people have heard about this, this distinction, easy problem, hard problem? Um, a few of you. Okay. Can I say something else? Psychosynthesis covers all that. Can you say what? Psychosynthesis. Psychosynthesis. Okay, we can talk about that later. Um, <laughs> so, for Chalmers, he... He, in a very influential set of papers about 20 years ago, he distinguished between the so-called easy problems of consciousness and the hard problem. Now, the easy problems are not easy at all. They're incredibly difficult. But they're basically the problems of figuring out how the brain does what it does, how it works, how its complicated circuitry underwrites all the functional capacities that we humans and other animals have, how we perceive, how we use perception to guide action, how we make decisions, um, things that you can measure from the outside, uh, what reports we would say about what we see. But basically, the easy problem is, is about figuring out how brains do what they do in ways which we can observe, validate from the outside as external observers. The hard problem is figuring out how and why any of this should have anything to do with conscious experience at all. You know, that magic step. Why are the lights on rather than off? How do conscious experiences qualia, as the philosophers say, why and how do they come about given any kind of explanation of the activity of neurons or neurotransmitters or whatever level of detail you want to go into? How and why should that ever generate the redness of red? That's, that's the hard problem um, for David Chalmers. And the intuition here is that solving the easy problem, figuring out how brains do what they do, would leave us completely in the dark about the hard problem, that no explanation in terms of mechanisms, neurons or anything, would shed any light on this hard problem of how and why consciousness happens. Now, there's already this analogy with life. I hope you can see that, that yeah, it's, it's pretty, I think, unproductive to make claims about what we still can't understand when we haven't done the hard work of trying to understand. Um, and it also cleaves the problem in an unhelpful way. So with sort of slightly to annoy David Chalmers, I've been talking about what I call the real problem of consciousness. The real problem is the problem of accounting for phenomenological properties. That's properties of consciousness in terms of mechanisms. So it's not the easy problem because the easy problem focuses on behavioral and functional things, things you can measure from the outside. So I want to try to explain properties of what conscious experiences are like. You know, what's the difference between a visual experience and an olfactory experience and an emotional experience and an experience of free will or volition? So it's targeting properties of consciousness. And it's not the hard problem either, because in order to do this, it's not necessary to explain how and why consciousness comes to be part of the universe in the first place. 
We know that it exists, we're all conscious, so we can map its properties onto properties of mechanisms, begin to explain them. If you can explain, predict and control, you've basically done everything that a scientific approach can do. Um, so there is uh, one of the things you can maybe look at if, if you're interested after the talk is there's a sort of public article in E.ON, uh, which is an online magazine called The Real Problem, which sort of argues for this in a bit more detail. But the question that's motivated me in my research over the last couple of decades is how can the structure and dynamics of the brain, together with the body and environment, account for the subjective phenomenological properties of consciousness? So that's the question. So we're trying to map mechanism, not just of the brain, but also appreciating that if we want to understand anything really about mind in general, but consciousness specifically, brains don't exist in isolation. They're continually interacting with the body, which is embedded in um, the world. Brains are embodied and bodies are embedded. And we need to understand these, um, these interactions too. And how can those interactions shed some light on what it is like to have this experience or that experience? So that's the question. And what then are the properties of consciousness that we might like to explain? What are the explanatory targets? Now, there's many different ways you can, you can skin this cat. Uh, and for today, I want to just divide it into to three. And this, these, this is a heuristic division. I'm not saying these aspects of consciousness are completely independent or that this is a consensus or the only way to do it. But this is the way that will provide us a nice uh, narrative for this talk. Conscious level. We can start with conscious level. Conscious level is simply the difference between being conscious at all and not being conscious as is the case in general anesthesia or coma or dreamless sleep. You can think of you know, a, le a level of consciousness that you, you gain at some point and then maybe there are different gradations of, con of level of consciousness when you are conscious, drowsiness compared to vivid awake, vivid awake alertness. Then there's conscious content. When you are conscious, you're conscious of something, the sights, sounds, smells, emotions, thoughts, beliefs that populate your inner universe at any one time. Not everything that our brain senses is reflected in our conscious experience of the world. In fact, what I'll argue for is that our conscious experiences are only indirectly related to things in the world in interesting ways. And then finally, and I think most interestingly, is conscious self. One of the things you're conscious of when you are conscious is the specific experience of being the subject of experience. The specific experience of being you or of being me. This isn't something to take for granted that sits behind all the rest of our experiences. This is another experience itself that has a particular character. And understanding that, I think, is the key, is where people often encounter the most resistance. For instance, if I try to give you an account of how and when and why you experience certain actions as voluntary, that is getting, for many people, to the heart at what they think should resist any kind of scientific explanation because that's the core of them, you know, the origin of voluntary action of free will. Um, but if we can begin to understand that, then I think we get to the real implication of a science of consciousness, which is not to explain why red things look red, but how we experience ourselves as part of the world around us and our role within that world. So that's where we're going, and we'll start with conscious level. What are the fundamental brain mechanisms that underlie being conscious at all? I mean, we can think of this, as I've said, as a scale. At one end, with zero consciousness, let's say in coma or general anesthesia, through deep sleep, light sleep, all the way up to conscious wakefulness. You can think of it, you know, this is an approximation, but to a first approximation, we can think of a single scale here. Um, but you can see this is along a diagonal because the first important thing about conscious level is it's not the same thing as physiological wakefulness or physiological arousal. It's often correlated, but it's not the same. And we notice when you are asleep, you're often dreaming. So you're having conscious experiences, but you're physiologically asleep. You know, you, the physical arousal levels are low. On the other hand, there are pathological states like absence epilepsy, or the vegetative state, which is now called the wakeful unawareness state, which you can go into if you suffer very bad brain injury, where you will 
behaviorally, you will go through cycles of sleep and wake. Your eyes will open. You'll look around. You may make odd movements. But there seems to be nobody home. Seem to be completely without conscious experiences at all. So the mechanisms that underlie being conscious at all are not the mechanisms. They're separable from those mechanisms that control whether we are awake or asleep. And this is, of course, clinically very important because one of the big challenges, um, I won't have much time to talk about this, but with the developments of intensive care, people are surviving injuries much more frequently that would otherwise kill them and ending up in what the neurologist Adrian Owen has called the grey zone, uh, where they are de diagnosed as being in a vegetative state. And often it's unclear whether they have any residual awareness or conscious experiences at all. And of course, this is something that we really need to know because it informs their treatment and it informs how one deals with their families and so on and so forth. Um, but anyway, we need to know what the mechanisms underlying conscious level are. And so you might think there's a few simple things to consider first. How about the number of neurons? Is being conscious simply a function of the, the number of neurons involved? Well, probably not. I've said we have about 88 uh, billion in our, in our brains. This is the cortex. I'm sure you know this by the end of the day now. It's cortex here. This is the cerebellum. Anybody know how many neurons are in the cerebellum compared to the rest of the brain? Much more. Half? Much more? It's about four times more neurons in the cerebellum than in the rest of the brain put together, which is a fact that I still think is extraordinary. And the cerebellum is a little brain hanging off the back of your brain. It has the vast majority of all the neurons that you have. Now, if you have damage to your cerebellum, lose it somehow through a stroke, or there are rare cases of cerebellar agenesis where people don't develop a cerebellum at all. Now, they have lots of problems in moving around, in sequencing their actions, even in sequencing their thoughts. But they are not unconscious. It doesn't seem to affect consciousness at all. So it's not simply the number of neurons. You can lose three quarters of the neurons in your brain. And your conscious experiences will be roughly, to a first approximation, unaffected at all. Is it any particular region? Are there, you know, is there a seat of consciousness somewhere in the brain? If it's not the pineal gland, is it somewhere else? Well, again, probably not. There are parts of the brain that if you suffer damage to them, you will lose consciousness forever. Certain uh, nuclei deep inside the thalamus, what you can't see here is there's a set of, this is the cortical surface, but there's part of the brain called the thalamus, which is a sort of relay station from the outside world to the brain and between different brain regions too. If you, if you have damage there, you will lose consciousness forever, but it seems to be that these are more like uh, you know, unplugging the TV. It's like an on-off switch rather than that's where you know, consciousness happens. Um, if you have damage to other parts of the brain, you may lose specific dimensions of your conscious experience. For, for example, the inability to experience colors or the inability to experience faces as different from one another or movement. Um, Oliver Sacks writes about this beautifully in his various neurological case studies. But again, you won't lose consciousness altogether. Of course, if you wipe out large parts of the brain, then yes, you do. That's what happens when people end up in coma, vegetative state. But no single region seems to be responsible. And it's not even a simple form of neural activity. Now, when you fall asleep and lose consciousness, yes, metabolic activity and firing rates of neurons in the brain go down, but they certainly don't shut off, and they don't go down by very much, actually, um, at all. And uh, even sort of more, slightly more interesting kinds of activity, like if you look at the extent to which different parts of the brain are synchronized. An early theory of consciousness talked a lot about synchrony, that if different parts of the brain are firing together at, let's say, 40 hertz, the so-called gamma band, then you know, somehow that leads to consciousness. Well, in fact, if you have too much synchrony in your brain, if the brain, all the neurons are firing uh, in lockstep with each other, what will happen is you'll have an epileptic seizure and lose consciousness. It's not, you know, Synchrony is not uh, the answer. So what is the answer? I'm going to sort of skip uh, a lot of intermediate research and bring you up to do some exciting stuff in the present day. And it seems to be, to put it very uh, abstractly, being conscious at all has to do with the different ways in which different parts of the brain speak to each other. It's to do with the patterns of information flow, causality and communication between different parts <laughs> 
of the cortex. And one way we can begin to look at that is um, by using techniques such as this. This is, a, this is from our lab at, at Sussex. And this is my lab manager who's being a guinea pig here. And what we do here is we use transcranial magnetic stimulation. How many people know about this, this technique? It's called TMS for short. What it is, it's basically just a way of injecting a very short, sharp pulse of electromagnetic energy into the brain. Um, and then this is, he's also wearing an EEG cap, electroencephalography, which measures the, the electrical activity of the brain. Now, it does so in a very coarse way. You know, these are individual sensors. If you think about the complexity of the brain that I've described, you know, 90 billion neurons all wired up. And this, uh, the, this is sort of, it's been described as trying to figure out how the brain works by you know, dangling a microphone above London uh, from you know, about two kilometers up and trying to figure out you know, what everybody's saying to each other. It's, it's not very, very easy. You can probably pick something up if everybody shouts something at the same time. Um, so you might pick up football games. And I annoyingly realized that the schedule this talk to clash with United against Arsenal, which I'm really <laughs> annoyed about. But anyway, never mind. It's another story. Um, so what you can do with this kind of setup is you can, you can inject a pulse and then basically record the echo of that pulse. It's a bit like banging on the brain with an electrical hammer and listening to the, the echo, the bell-like echo of the brain after you've stimulated it with this, with this pulse. And you can sort of stimulate different parts here and there um, in, in interesting ways. So this line of approach, this was pioneered by a, a colleague and friend of mine, Marcello Massimini in, in Milan. And uh, what he did, his first study, was to just compare people who were in early stages of sleep, so not dreaming, and people who were awake. And what you'll see in these movies, which is very, they're very heavily slowed down, um, you'll see the TMS pulse, and then you'll just see a movie of the echo as it, what happens to it over the cortical surface. And so you can see the pulse. If you look at what's happening when the person is asleep, it will, it will loop around. There's still a response, but it stays very locally to the site of stimulation. But when the person is awake, the pulse moves around in complicated spatial and temporal patterns um, across the brain. You know, this, is like, this is about now 200 milliseconds, so it's still a fifth of a second. Um, these things happen quite quickly. Uh, here we go again. So you can see this. There is a response, but it doesn't move uh, around the brain very much. And when you're awake, it does. What this suggests is that in the conscious awake state, uh, there is much more functional connectivity, or, or what we call effective connectivity in the brain. That is, different parts of the brain, when active, can cause activity in many other parts of the brain. But again, the whole thing doesn't just sort of take off. You don't have an epileptic seizure. It, there's some sort of precision to, to what's happening there. And what's been very exciting about this is we can start to quantify uh, the difference between these two patterns, put a number to it. And this is what's shown at the bottom here. This is called the, the PCI, which stands for the Perturbation Complexity Index. This is important because what this is, what this is it's the first version of a consciousnessometer, of a thermometer for level of consciousness. Now, it's still very crude, but it's the first time that, that people have actually been able to put a number that has some empirical robustness and, and purchase. What you can see here is that um, these are the PCI. So the way this number is derived is by basically you can imagine um, unwrapping this pattern over time. So millisecond, I should have had a figure for this, but millisecond by millisecond, you unwrap it by time. And then every millisecond, you've got a kind of pattern of which brain areas are part of the echo and which aren't. You have basically this kind of complicated pattern of black and white that, that evolves over time. What you want to know is how random is that? You know, if the brain is not active at all, it's, it's a very simple thing. It's just white. If the brain's always active, it's always it's black. Um, so to quantify how complicated that pattern is, you basically try to compress it using an algorithm which is just the same as the algorithm that your phone will use when you send a digital photo. It finds the minimum description length of uh, an image. How, how, what's the minimum string of ones and zeros that you need to recreate a picture, an image. It will always be smaller than the image itself because, in, you know, think about a digital photo or even this, nearby pixels are always correlated. It's only when things are different that you need to say something. 
So you can come up with a number simply by asking how, uh, what's the minimum way to length of ones and zeros that you need to describe this pattern of activity. That's the PCI. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's called PCI because it's dependent on a perturbation, it's complexity because you're measuring the compressibility, and it's an index because it's a number. It goes between zero and one. And what's plotted here is the PCI for various people who have been diagnosed as being in the vegetative state, in the minimally conscious state, which is when people show transient signs of consciousness after some amount of recovery, after severe brain injury, and in what's called the locked-in condition, where people are completely paralyzed, but nonetheless have completely intact conscious experiences. Uh, those of you who've seen The Diving Bell and the Butterfly or read the book will know about the, the locked-in syndrome. And these are healthy controls who are um, either awake uh, or um, asleep or having some ketamine going on. Um, we'll come back to that. Uh, but what you can see, I hope, is that this number tracks the emergence of consciousness quite well across individuals. Now, this is cross-sectional. It's not longitudinal. You know, what would need to be done is for a given person is see how their clinical state varies as they individually move along this scale. But even so, it's quite exciting that we have a number that is a first approximation of how conscious somebody is. And they're interesting, you know, this person here is behaviorally diagnosed as being in a vegetative state, but their PCI is basically consistent with them being conscious. That's somebody you'd want to take a closer look at um, in the hospital. So this is exciting developments have been around for now about four or five years. We've been doing some similar work in the lab in Sussex, not but without using the TMS impulse, just recording the spontaneous activity of the brain and again applying the same sorts of algorithms. We just want to measure how complex that signal is, how, how diverse, how compressible it is. Um, this is like raw EEG from a wake state, a waking restful state and from loss of consciousness, in this case under propofol anesthesia. Uh, again, what we do is we convert all these brain signals into ones and zeros just to simplify them, calculate their complexity, how much, how far can we compress this string of ones and zeros, and what we see is a nice uh, correlation between uh, high values of complexity when people are conscious and awake, and low values under general anesthesia, intermediate values for, for mild sedation. Now for those of you who know a bit more about this stuff, this important thing about here is th these changes in complexity are independent of changes in the spectral power of the brain signal. So we know, for instance, that when people fall asleep, you see an increase in slow wave activity in the low frequencies. Um, but we can characterize changes in complexity that, that are independent of these changes in uh, spectral power. We've also done this in, in sleep here. This is a different kind of data set. This is an intracranial data set. So this is in collaboration with people in Milan. And what's happening here is we're able to record from deep within the human brain. These are patients who have been hospitalized because they need brain surgery to remove part of the brain from which epileptic seizures start. So it's sort of last resort for intractable epilepsy. And uh, in order for the surgery to be done, they, we need to localize where the seizures come from. So basically, you implant a bunch of electrodes and just leave them in for uh, you know, usually a few days or even a couple of weeks until that person has had a sufficient number of seizures that you can figure out wh where the bit of the brain is that, that you need to, to remove. Um, but of course, you can record from the brain all the time, and people will go to sleep and wake up again. So we have some data from deep within the brain. This just shows over a number of patients where the electrodes were. And we can sort of, again, measure their complexity. And what we see is pretty much the same thing, that uh, complexity values are higher during waking rest than um, early stages of sleep when people are less likely to dream. But in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, where dream reports are most frequent, it's actually pretty much the same as when people are awake. So this is now teasing apart wakefulness from consciousness. And we see the values here are the same for consciousness, but not for um, wakefulness. Uh, this thing here, these are four different parts of the brain, the frontal part, parietal, other, we divide it into the four main lobes, occipital, temporal, parietal, frontal. Frontal parts of the brain always seem to have more complexity going on regardless, and, and we don't still trying to understand how and why that is. Um, 
So in both examples I've shown you so far, they've involved the reduction of complexity from a baseline of waking state. Different ways of losing consciousness, whether it's brain injury, whether it's anesthesia, whether it's falling asleep. Um, in the most recent study we've done, it's now just coming up to a year ago, uh, we worked with people in London, uh, Robin Carr Harris and his group at Imperial, who've been pioneering the brain imaging of uh, people while taking psychedelics. Um, psilocybin, ketamine, in low doses. In high doses, ketamine is an anesthetic. Low doses, it's a hallucinogenic and, and LSD, of course. Uh, and they have, again, they have, in this case, MEG, magnetoencephalography, which is basically the same as EEG. It's all measuring the, the fine electro, electromagnetic fields that are generated by neural activity. Um, but what we can see here, quite interestingly, is that the level of complexity reliably, all these this is zero, it always goes up. So there's a sort of increase in complexity um, in the psychedelic state compared to the baseline for all the different uh, compounds. And this was kind of interesting because we'd been looking for a while, were there any situations where we would see a measure of conscious level go above baseline rather than go down? This is so far still the only example uh, that, that we found. And of course, because it came from psychedelic drugs, we got all kinds of amusing headlines like um, brain scans reveal evidence for a higher state of consciousness, and, um, which is of course not, not, tr not really true. And they say, oh, why, why do we need science to do that? You know, of course we know that, that hallucinogenics give you a higher state of consciousness. What we've actually found is that on a particular measure of neural signal complexity or diversity, that there's a reliable difference in the brain that is, goes the opposite direction from sleep anesthesia and, and so on. Um, there's basically more disorganization in the psychedelic brain. Um, the Daily Mail also wrote it up, but being the Daily Mail, they had to accompany it by a very large sidebar pointing to all the dangers of, of LSD, um, which I do find, you know, much as I love the Daily Mail, I find, um, which is not very much, um, find it quite annoying bec because the work of Robin's group here and other groups too, and one reason we're interested in is that there is enormous promise in, in psychedelic drugs for uh, treatment of things like depression and PTSD. Um, and I think it's hugely, it's a big tragedy for medical science that these, uh, this line of research has been, until very recently, closed down and is still very much under threat. We, we're still continuing this work, actually. This is just to show you some of the stuff that we're doing right at the moment. Um, it's still on the same data. But what we've done here with uh, my colleague Lionel Barnett is we've looked in more detail at the dynamics of the brain in the psychedelic state. And we found something which I, still find, which I find very interesting and I'm still struggling to understand, which is that for each of the psychedelic compounds, this is the brain divided up into 90 different small regions. So again, it's MEG data. And here, if we just look at the correlation in activity between the different regions, how much the, you know, the brain signal moves together, we see it goes up compared to baseline. Red is more. So the br brain regions are more highly synchronized in the psychedelic state, which is weird. Um, but then if we look at w this other measure, and this I think is a measure that's not often applied in neuroscience. This is a measure called Granger causality. What it basically does is it, it measures information flow. It doesn't look at how correlated different brain regions are. It looks at how well you can predict one region from knowing what's going on in another region. It's different, so, and it's, so it's really about the flow of information rather than how different brain regions are moving together. And if you look at this measure, you see it goes down. Blue is less than zero compared to baseline. So this is evidence that the parts of the brain are speaking to each other less frequently or less intensively or less by this measure in the psychedelic state, although they seem to be more correlated. And in most experiments, this is a bit harder to measure statistically. So in many studies, people only look at this and they say, ah, the brain is more synchronized, so there's more communication going on between brain regions. What we find is the opposite. And um, so we need to understand that and see if that generalizes to other things like what happens when you fall asleep. We don't know that yet. Hopefully, find out soon. But anyway, this is the main result that this measure, but back to the idea of measurement, this measure of conscious level goes up uh, when you're in the psychedelic state. Now, 
the excite I think the, the reason to focus on measures like this that try to characterize uh, consciousness in terms of the complexity of the neural dynamics. This is interesting because it's based on a particular theory about what consciousness actually is and how it should relate to um, underlying mechanisms. Back to this idea of the real problem, trying to map between mechanism and phenomenology. And the basic idea is, goes back to work by uh, the Italian neuroscientist Giulio Tononi and, his, and Gerald Edelman who worked together. Edelman was my old boss, so I did my postdoc in San Diego in the early 2000s. Edelman was one of these people like Francis Crick who had won their Nobel Prize in a different area of biology and then thought, right, now I've won a Nobel Prize, I can go and figure out consciousness. Um, because in those days, as I said, you know, the only way you could do it legitimately, you couldn't do it as a student, you had to kind of win a Nobel Prize. But fortunately, you don't have to do that now, otherwise I would still I'd never get around to it. But the basic idea that, that drove this theory, which is now called the Integrated Information Theory of Consciousness, is some very simple, but I think very meaningful observations. The first is that every conscious experience that you have is unique. It's highly informative for the organism that you are. Every experience that you have had, having right now, is different from every other experience you've ever had, ever will have, or ever could have. Even the experience of pure darkness rules out a vast repertoire of alternative possible experiences that you could be having. You could be having much more fun experience right here, right now, but you're having this experience of listening to me go on about experience. That is not an experience that you will have again, fortunately, not, at least not in exactly this way. Um, but this is formally what we mean by information. Information is how much uncertainty is reduced by a system being in a particular state. Um, and by you ex having this experience right now and not any other experience that you could have, there's a huge amount of information that's been generated. You know, compared to a simple photodiode that could either only ever be on or off, depending on whether it's light or dark. Now, for the photodiode, things aren't light or dark because light or dark, for us, is, you know, it's in the context of many other possible discriminations that we can make. If there's only ever light or dark, there's just one or zero, there's really nothing. So consciousness is highly informative, but it's also integrated. So every conscious experience that we have, we experience as all of a piece. We don't experience colors and shapes separately from each other. You're experiencing a single unified conscious scene right here, right now. Now, possibly there are cases where this might break down in various pathologies or in split brain cases and other weird cases. But for the most part, we have a single stream of consciousness. Um, this just shows, this is one of these examples to kind of illustrate this a little bit. That you, can, you know, this is uh, the Rubin face vase illusion. You can either see a vase or two faces uh, facing each other, but usually not both at the same time. In fact, the more I've looked at it, the more I can tend to see both at the same time. But the point is that that <laughs> really you should only be able to see one. So we have this combined two properties in our conscious experience that they are both they're simultaneously informative. They rule out a lot of possibilities, and they're integrated. They're somehow all of a piece. And knowing that allows us to begin to write down mathematical measures that capture this middle ground, that describes this phenomenology. So systems that are not like this, which is where everything is integrated, but everything is connected to everything. So there's not many states this system can enter. There's not much information. Or systems like this, where thing, every part of it can do something different, so it can enter a lot of different states, a lot of information, but there's no integration. Everything is sort of falling apart and independent. So we can come up with this middle ground, just schematically uh, looks a bit like this, um, and figure out different ways to quantify that middle ground. And that's what some of these measures of complexity that I've been describing try to do. They don't respond to that case or that case, but that case, which is why there's reason to believe they should be sensitive to changes in conscious level. It also helps us understand uh, uh, one of the mysteries that I mentioned earlier, which is why does the cerebellum have nothing to do or very little to do with consciousness, but the rest of the cortex has a lot to do with it. This is a, a sort of slice through part of the visual cortex. And the only thing I want you to take home from this is that it's very complicated. There's lots of recurrent connections between different parts of the, of the brain. Um, and this is just the part of the brain that's involved in, in vision. Um, signals flowing laterally, backwards, forwards, in, in all directions. And this is certainly oversimplified. If you look at the cerebellum, 
it's much different. Yes, there's four times more neurons, but basically the cerebellum is, seems to be like a, a vast number of relatively independent circuits. It's organized like a crystal into layers, and each layer is implementing probably the same kind of computation, um, but in a way that doesn't depend very much on what's going on in the layer next to it or in the layer next to that. So what you have here is a, a re you can predict just from the anatomy of the cerebellum that it will not have a very high value of integration, that it won't, won't sort of underlie that property that we, that we expect a measure of consciousness to have. So this is a nice way of, of sort of understanding the relationship between anatomy and consciousness. Now, one of the things we've been doing in the lab is try to move beyond these. The measures that I've described so far are relatively simple, relatively blunt ways of characterizing this, this complexity. And for a number of years, we've been work, trying to uh, develop more um, sophisticated ways which capture in a richer way this balance of or combination of integration in information. So, so like, I'm sure you can uh, you know, just have a look at that equation and, and, and we'll ask questions about it, or I'll ask questions about it later. Um, here's another one, which is, I think, even more beautiful. But basically, this is what they're trying to do. They're, they're trying to measure um, the extent to which a system is both capable of entering a lot of different states and the extent to which that this, each state is globally unified. And there are just various ways one can do that mathematically. And so that's where this, this line of work is going. And um, zooming out for a bit, this, I think... There's a lesson for this sort of approach, which is a very positive lesson in the history of science. So I've been talking a lot about measurement, coming up with a number. Well, why? You know, when people were figuring out life, they didn't worry about measuring the amount of life uh, that a creature has. It was, you know, that wasn't how the problem was solved. But nonetheless, I, there are other... This is why it might be an imperfect analogy. That there are other areas of science where measurement, and very frequently measurement has proven to be the key in naturalizing something that was previously mysterious. You know, measurement is really what empirical science is leveraged by. You know, without the ability to measure, you can't make specific testable predictions very frequently. Um, and a great example of this is our understanding of temperature and, and heat. Uh, we all now know what heat is. It's the mean molecular kinetic energy of, of molecules in a substance. But there was a time again where heat was pretty mysterious. It was this calorific substance that flew in and out, flew from hot things towards cold things. Um, nobody really knew what it was. Uh, in order to try to naturalize heat, to try to understand what it actually is, it was necessary to find ways to measure heat. And there's a one of my favorite books in the, whole, in the history of science is by Hasok Chang called Inventing Temperature. And it tells the story of how uh, there was a huge, hugely controversial um, activity in trying to come up with a reliable thermometer because how can you do it? You know, how can you validate a thermometer unless you've already got one you know, or a scale? Uh, and so people were starting to design things like glass vessels, but they would have impurities, so you, you know, they, they never showed the same reading twice. And bit by bit, accurate thermometers bootstrap themselves into existence. Oh, yeah, there's one thing I can't beautiful part of the story is that um, if you need, if you try and develop a thermometer, you need a fixed point. You need a fixed point from which you use as a reference. And how do you get a fixed point without a thermometer? Well, you have to have some a priori idea that something is not changing with respect to temperature. So for, uh, people tried blood, but you know, blood changes and you sort of, there are reasons to believe that blood changes. So for, for a period of time, the zero point of temperature was taken to be a piece of cheese in a basement in Paris. Um, <laughs> But now we have thermometers, and now, you know, and this, this development of modern thermometry has really transformed our understanding of heat from not just something that feels hot or cold to something that we understand the physical basis of. And we can talk about now the temperature at the surface of the sun or you know, absolute zero in, 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 in interstellar space. We know what temperature is in a way uh, that, that, we, you know, that we didn't before. And so the the hope here is that maybe the ability to measure consciousness would lead to a similar transformation or at least be a step on the way to that transformation if consciousness is something that one can measure. So that's conscious level. To summarize that, a complex balance of differentiation and integration. And with that, I think it's... Uh, oh, the next thing I'll go on to 
is conscious content, but let's take a five minute break and then uh, we'll come back for the, for the second part. I wanted part. to give you an example of something that highlights this issue of conscious content. Um, and so the idea of conscious content, now we move on from level when you're conscious, you're conscious of something. And so this is a, an excuse to show you one of my favorite sort of visual illusions and demonstrations. How many people have seen the lilac chaser before this thing? A few of you. So um, what I would like you all to do is just focus your attention on this central black cross. I don't know if it's possible to take the lights down for a second. If not, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, but if you just look at the black cross, try not to move your eyes or blink too much. What do you see? Green? A green circle? Green circle moving around? Yeah? What happens to the magenta patches? Disappear. Okay. Now blink, move your eyes and have another look. They're back, right? So... There is no green circle. There is no, there is no spoon. There is no green circle. Um, yes, there is. <laughs> no, there isn't. No, no, there isn't. Um, what's actually going on here is a combination of at least three different visual effects. The first thing that's going on here is something called trox the fading. If you're fixating somewhere in the visual field, then things that are out there in the periphery don't have to be very far from the center of your vision that have indistinct boundaries will tend to fade away and be filled in by what surrounds them. That's called trox the fading. The second thing that's going on is apparent motion. When things come on or off in proximity to each other, we tend to infer that there's something moving between them. This is, of course, what happens in cinema. Um, you know, we, we, uh, so we'll tend to perceive something moving. Um, between them, when of course there isn't anything, just things turning on and off. And the final thing that's happening is colour opponency, which is that when the brain adapts to a particular colour being there and it goes away, we see in colour space the opposite of that colour. And the opposite in colour space of magenta is green. Now there's actually a fourth thing going on here, which is, I mean, we know from Newton, right, that colours don't really exist out there in the world. They're what the brain generates to make sense of electromagnetic radiation that, that impacts the eyes. It's a way of picking out invariances in the environment. So, you know, colours are a construction of the brain. But magenta exists even less than other colours. Uh, the reason being that you make magenta by mixing red and blue light. If you think about the electromagnetic spectrum, you have red, blue and green is in the middle. So typically out there in the world, if you're encountering red and blue light, you're also expecting green. And if you don't get green, then what does the brain do? It like, oh, you know, has to make something up. Uh, and so it makes up magenta. Magenta is what the brain invents when it's expecting green and it's not getting it. So the green you're seeing here is basically not not green. Um, so that's what's happening there. And that just makes the point that what you consciously experience is only very indirectly, at least in this case, indirectly related to what's out there in the world and what I want to argue is that this, that this is true all the time. It's not just true in these uh, extreme circumstances. Um, so just imagine being a brain for a minute. Imagine you are your brain. And imagine that perception is the business of trying to figure out what's out there in the world, if there is anything out there in the world. Now, the, there's no sound inside the skull. There's no light either. Um, it's dark in there, if it's anything. All the brain has to go on are noisy and ambiguous electrical signals that are only indirectly related to things in the world, whatever they may be. Very noisy and ambiguous. So perception, figuring out what's there, has to be a process of inference uh, in which the brain combines its prior expectations about the way the world is with this ambiguous sensory data to come up with its best guess, its best inference about the causes of those sensory signals. And that's what we then perceive. It's the brain's best guess of the causes of whatever sensory data is impacting our brains right here and right now. So let me give you a couple more examples that just illustrate this, this point. This is something that's going on all this time. This is a pretty famous visual illusion called Adelson's checkerboard. How many people have seen this before? Many of you. Okay. So if you look at the two patches A and B that highlighted conveniently here, they should look to you to be different shades of grey, yes? Does everybody see that? Yes? Yeah, yeah, good. Anybody not see it? 
Okay, so they are, of course, the exact same shade of grey. That's why it's an illusion. Um, and if you don't believe me, I can show you by another version of the image here where I've joined up the two patches, and you can see that it's one continuous shade of grey. If you think this is not the same image and I'm cheating, well, I'll just move that grey bar across, and you can see there's no division at all. It's exactly the same shade of grey. Take it away, and it looks different again. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that the brain is using its knowledge that's built deep into the circuitry of the visual cortex that objects under shadow are darker than, um, uh, sorry, are lighter than they appear. Things get darker under shadow. That's why we see B as lighter than it really is because of the shadow cast by this. So our brain makes an inference that this is actually lighter than it appears. Um, and the checkerboard just accentuates that. So there's, another, there's an inferential process going on. Even if you know about this as well, you can't help but, um, but see it. Here's another example. Have, let's hope the sound works. And some of you will have heard this before. If you have, then please just uh, don't say anything until the end. Okay. Random sort of noisy, whistly things. Try again. Okay, now have a listen to this, which is the same thing, but unprocessed. I think Brexit is a really terrible idea. <laughs> sorry, do. Um, no, I'm not sorry, actually. Um, now have a listen to the original, and it's going to play you exactly the same sound again that I played in the first time. I think Brexit is a really terrible idea. Okay. So now you can all understand that, right? You can hear words, which was previously just a bunch of noisy whistles. Um, one more time, just for fun. Um, what's remarkable here is that the sensory input hasn't changed at all. You know, all that's changed is your brain's prior expectations or best or about what caused that sensory information, and that changes what you consciously perceive. So our prior expectations are really, really critical in shaping what we consciously perceive. Now, there's a sort of mathematical way to think about all this, which is Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem is, one of, is the foundation of modern probability theory, and it just tells us what we should do, or what any system should do, if it's trying to update its beliefs as new evidence comes in. So you might have, you know, this is... Everything here is represented by a curve. Your yellow curve here might represent your prior belief, for instance, that I said something about Brexit. Um, and then the sense data may be ambiguous or, or say something else. And then the green curve is the combination of these two curves. It's called the Bayesian posterior. And it's just the brain's best guess of, of how to combine sensory data with prior beliefs. And so basically the claim is in perception, this is the brain is doing something like this. There are things in the brain that represent these sorts of probability distributions that have means and variances. Of course, the sharper this curve, that means the more confidence the brain will put in the sensory data, the further the perception will be drawn towards the sensory data. Um, so you know, it's not just taking them both equally. They can be drawn more towards one or the other. But the claim is the brain is doing something like this process of Bayesian inference when it's doing perception. And this changes quite fundamentally how we think about how the brain does perception. So here's the visual system of the monkey. And typically, we think of it in terms of a feed-forward architecture where signals come into the retina and they percolate deep into the brain, uh, with early errors dealing with things like lines and contrast and deeper areas dealing with things like objects and faces. But the perceptual heavy lifting here is done in this feed forward or bottom up direction. Now this idea of the Bayesian brain, uh, which also traces back to the German physiologist and physicist Hermann von Helmholtz, says something very different. It says that perception depends not only on signals, sensory signals that come from the outside into the brain, but as much if not more on perceptual predictions that flow in the opposite direction from the inside of the brain back out to the sensory surfaces. These green arrows schematize the idea that what carries the contents of our perception is not the sensory signals, but the stuff that's going the other way, the stuff that's carrying the brain's best guesses uh, about the causes of those sensory signals. So perception happens uh, 
as much if not more from the inside out as from the outside in. You can map this idea onto the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology of the brain. This is a schematic of different uh, levels of the visual cortex. And the idea here now is that in each level, the blue arrows are just conveying predictions from one level down to the, the next level below. So from high levels of the visual cortex right back to the first sensory relays. And the bottom-up signals, the, the red arrows, just convey the prediction errors. So what we tend to think of as sensory signals coming in, they're just the errors, the mismatches between what the brain expects and what it gets at every level of processing. And perception then involves just the minimization of prediction error continuously across all the different levels, which has a really weird implication that we could still perceive things. In fact, we might perceive things most accurately when there's no signals flowing up through the brain at all because our predictions perfectly predict what the incoming sensory data is. Um, so, I'll skip this, it's a bit boring. And there's quite a lot of um, <laughs> evidence for, for this view now. This is actually an early study from, from Vincent Walsh, who was here this morning. Um, and I don't know if he talked about this particular study, I was not here, uh, but if you use TMS, again, this transcranial magnetic stimulation, to knock out specifically the signals that go backwards uh, in the visual cortex, you specifically knock out conscious awareness, in this case of movement. Um, this is back in before this theoretical framework was available, but this empirical evidence is still very meaningful. Um, again, in my lab, we've been doing some similar studies, which I'll just give you a flavor for. Uh, we asked a very simple question, do people consciously see what they expect to see or what challenges or violates their expectations? And a simple experiment where we show people, uh, this is called continuous flash suppression. So people wear a kind of stereoscope so they see each image in a different eye. So in one eye they see an image which is either a house or face which gradually increases in contrast. And in the other eye they see a changing pattern of shapes which gradually decreases in contrast. And at some point the image will break through, people will become aware of it and say, ah, oh, I see it, it's a house or a face. And what we do is we cue them to either expect to see a house or a face and just ask the question, if they're expecting a face, does it break through into their conscious awareness earlier? And the short answer is, yes, it does, over you know, many control experiments and, and so on. But the short answer is that we see what we expect to see. Um, in other experiments, we've tried to map this more closely now onto what's actually happening in the brain during this kind of process. And this is work with my PhD student, Maxine Sherman, and really dull experiments where people just say whether this boring patch of lines was present or not on a given trial. But while people make these kinds of decisions about presence and absence, we can measure the electrical activity in their brain, and what we find is in the visual part of the brain at the back, there's usually a very prominent rhythm called the alpha rhythm at about 10 hertz. It's much more prominent when you close your eyes, but it's there even when you don't. And uh, what we found is that the phase of this alpha rhythm has a big effect on the extent to which your expectations influence what you see. Now that's a complicated sentence, but what it basically means is you can imagine this wave of activity going up and down in the back of the brain and at a certain point of that wave, maybe the crest of it, if you're expecting to see the patch and it's there, um, you know, you'll be more likely to say it's there. So your, your perceptual decision will be much more influenced by what you expect than by the actual sensory data. And then, then when the wave is at the, at the trough, at the other part of the cycle, you know, uh, 50 milliseconds later, then your perceptual expectation will have the least effect and the sensory data will have the most effect. So the idea here is there's this constant oscillation between your predictions and then the sensory data and this may be orchestrated by this alpha rhythm in the brain. Um, now this is all well and good but this is all very sort of low level experiments about you know was that patch of light there or not there um, repeat a thousand times. It doesn't have much to do with our, our rich experience of the visual world around us, which is full of objects, people, and the spaces in between them. So what, I, um, what we've also been doing is trying to develop experimental methodologies that get a bit more about what vision is really like uh, for us most of the time you know, out there in, in the wild. Uh, 
And I just wanted to mention in this context uh, another line of work that I've been thinking a lot more about, which is art history. In sort of the older traditions in art history, this is Ernst Gombrich who wrote the classic book Story of Art, among other things. And he has a concept called the beholder's share. This is kind of unfashionable in art history these days. But this is the idea that you know, when you're encountering a piece of art, the observer uh, brings to bear a great deal in the act of perception. It's not all there you know, in the painting. The observers, I'll have to take questions at the end, I think, otherwise I won't get through. Um, that it's the observer's perceptual machinery that is involved in the impact that art has. And I think this is really well reflected in things like <laughs> Impressionist art. I'm a bit, you know, naive when it comes to art, so I love this kind of classic stuff. Um, but you can imagine what is going on here: is the artist is reverse engineering the perceptual system. They're not painting the results of perceptual inference. They're reverse engineering to paint the light, the raw materials that your perceptual system engages with to generate the impression of a scene. So here, dirty palette scrapings on a canvas can convey a rich experience of of trees and river and movement and so on. And if you think about it, this is a really phenomenal skill because to be able to do this, the artist has to have an understanding of all the steps that the visual system is engaged in, which extracts objects and meaning from mere patterns of light. Um, so I think this is, you know, is a beautiful example of two insights coming together from different directions. And in fact, Gombrich back in Vienna in the the early 19th century was interacting with a lot of the early psychologists as well and, and talking about the parallels between these, these approaches, which you know, sort of got sidelined later on, unfortunately. He said, it's the power of expectation rather than the power of conceptual knowledge that moulds what we see in life, no less than in art, which I think is a you know, really prescient way of capturing some of the insights of modern uh, neuroscience here. Um, written a long paper about this, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> So we've been back to trying to capture some of this more naturalistic aspects of vision. We've been using things like virtual reality to try to do this in some interesting ways uh, in the lab. And one of the things we've been focusing on is how and why we perceive things as being objects. This is again, here's the you know, famous painting by Magritte, The Treachery of Images. This isn't a pipe, it's a picture of a pipe. It's in fact a picture of a picture of a pipe. Um, <laughs> but what determines when we experience something as an object? Now if I look at my phone now, in some sense I perceive this as being an object, as having a three-dimensional volumetric extent. Uh, I perceive it as having a back and sides even if I can't immediately see them. Well, why is that? Why don't I just perceive this as a sort of flat picture of an object? Well, the whole line of work in psychology suggests this is because my brain is somehow not only predicting the most likely cause of current sensory input, but it's predicting how that sensory input would change if I were to make various actions, rotate it or move around it. You know, if I move around to the back of a picture, I no longer see the picture of the pipe. But if I move around the back of a real pipe, I still see the pipe. So we can begin to play with these ideas in VR by generating situations where we have unfamiliar objects that behave in weird ways when people interact with them. So here's an object that, that behaves normally as you spin it around and so on. So it's, it, would, it, it supports the generation of useful predictions. This is like the moon. This object always shows you the same face no matter what you do. Um, so it gives you a very uncanny feeling of, is it really there or not? And this is an object which behaves in weird and unpredictable ways when you move. And so the idea here is, and this is still ongoing work, that we can manipulate these predictions about the sensory consequences of actions, and that should impact the extent to which not whether people see it or not, but whether they see it as an object or not. To try to explain something about, more rich about the phenomenology of, of objecthood, which again is you know, nicely represented in Picasso's stuff here, about you know, what, what does it mean to, to be an object in the world. Um, another thing we can look at is hallucination. Uh, so if you think of perception as this continual balancing act between prior expectations and sensory data, what if the balance is, goes a bit wrong? What if the balance in my brain becomes unlike the balance in all of your brains. Would I start to see things that you don't? And um, the way we begin to address this is by using these are these sort of things, these are deep convolutional neural networks. These are neural networks that have been used widely in AI now to do image classification. Basically you can show an image to this network and it will tell you if there's a dog in it and if so what kind of dog. Very good at classifying dogs. Um, 
But what you can also do is you can run it backwards. And some of you may have seen this. It's called Deep Dream. You can run it backwards. Basically, you give it any image and you run it backwards. And it's effectively like saying to the network, there is a dog there. Now change the image until you agree. Um, so you update the image until it, the network is satisfied that it contains a dog. And if you do this, dogs sprout up everywhere in an image. So what we've done is we put this into, we took a panoramic movie of Sussex campus and fed every frame through this algorithm. And um, then you can put a headset on and you can look around and you will have an extraordinary experience of dogs coming out of everywhere uh, in... Um, Hmm? Well, yeah. Now, some of you uh, who've sort of experimented with certain substances might find <laughs> some resemblance between this kind of imagery and what you will have experienced under psychedelics. Uh, yeah. So this isn't really like a schizophrenic hallucination, but it is very much like uh, a psychedelic hallucination. And it's not just like having dogs photoshopped onto the image. You know, they're really coming out of the image at all levels. Um, and so there's something important here, which is that you know, it gives us a clue to the way we're generating this image is picking up something about how the brain generates experiences of dogs in the first place, and of anything really. And also what might be happening when people are experiencing, let's say, a psychedelic hallucination. And we can do other things. We can fix other layers of the network and generate other kinds of hallucinations. So this is a more low level. So instead of seeing whole dogs here, you just see kind of dog parts and eyes and cropping up in, in, in weird places. So you can start to model different kinds of hallucination this way um, and, and figure out well, what might be going on in the visual system of somebody that's experiencing a psychedelic hallucination versus, let's say, a, a, psycho a psychotic one. Um, and you know, if we, this is just a questionnaire thing. If we actually ask people to rate their experiences in what we've been calling the hallucination machine along various dimensions like... Uh, space distortions, sense of peace, intensity, sense of... You get a very similar pattern to what people have reported when taking, in this case, magic mushrooms. Um, so there is a quite a, a, a subjective similarity here. So think about this for a second. I mean, the, 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 um, the point of that is that we can think about hallucination as a sort of uncontrolled perception where our perceptual predictions are not being sufficiently reined in by sensory data. By the same token, we can think of normal perception here and now as also a kind of hallucination, but a controlled hallucination, where our predictions are being regularly reined in, updated, constrained by sensory signals coming uh, from the world. And in fact, you know, we are all hallucinating all the time. It's just that whenever we agree about our, our hallucinations, that's what we call the real world. So... I'll finish up with just a couple, actually, um, yeah, I'm running, <laughs> as usual, when I thought I had more time, I put a lot more stuff in, and just to ensure that I'm still going to run out of time. Um, <laughs> we can also apply this, this idea to other forms of perception, in this case, time perception. We don't have time sensors in the brain, but we all have a perception of time passing, of duration. How does this happen? You know, a naive idea of time perception is that we have a clock in the head. We don't have a clock in the head. I mean, maybe we do at the level of 24-hour cycles. I have jet lag at the moment. Um, but over the time scale of seconds and something, not really. We don't have a clock in the head. So perception of time is also an inference. And we work with Warwick Roseboom and another of my colleagues at Sussex. We've been looking at how we can understand time perception as an inference on how quickly perceptual dynamics change over time. And so we build another of these network models that we show movies that have particular durations and we just observe how the states of the network at all the different levels change from frame to frame and then we use those rates of change as the basis for the network to estimate the duration of the, um, of the video. Uh, so we have a network, we have a set of videos, the network will estimate the duration just based on an inference about the, how quickly the perceptions the, the, you know, the inferences change, and people watch the videos as well, and we, we measure where they look on the videos. We use eye tracking to measure where they look. Here's one of the typical videos we use. Uh, we should do this with the psychedelic movies as well. That would be interesting. But at the moment, we just have videos of things like cows and street scenes and um, getting a nice tour of Sussex as well as part of this talk. Um, 
And what we find is that we can model very, very closely human reports. So this is how humans judge videos. Longer videos are longer, but they're also characteristic biases. They always judge longer videos as a bit shorter than they really are, and short videos as longer than they really are. And the model that we have basically does exactly the same. So we can recover the exact the way people experience duration is well explained by them just making inference on how, in this case, their visual <laughs> experience is, is changing. No need for a clock in the head. And again, people use same biases, so people judge busy scenes as lasting longer, city scenes than office scenes where not much happens. The model does the same thing. We can even do it in real time. This is by fit, putting a camera on a laptop, um, running that model, and it will estimate the duration of events in real time, in this case, walking through um, a station. I don't know where it is, some station in London. So time is also an inference. Now, this brings to the second uh, take home, and I'm going to just briefly mention the third part of the talk and then wrap up. Conscious content is the brain's best guess of the causes of sensory input. It's this kind of controlled hallucination. Now, the last part of the talk, the last message is this same thing applies to our experiences of being a self too. Just as we perceive the outside world as a construction, or we don't perceive it as a construction, it is a construction of our brains. The same applies to our experiences of being a self. It's also a kind of controlled hallucination. And in fact, there are many different ways we experience being a self. There's the experience of having a particular body and of being a particular body in the world. There are experiences of perceiving the world from a particular first-person perspective, of making volitional actions, choosing to do this or that. And only then of being a person that has a continuous identity from hour to hour, day to day, and year to year, that's associated with an I and a name. And then even beyond that, we can think about how I experience myself refracted through how I perceive you as perceiving me, the social self. Um, I'll just mention a couple of things about the bodily self to show you that it's also a construction based on the brain's best guess of the causes of body-related signals another kind of controlled hallucination. Now, you may have seen this before. This is the, the rubber hand illusion, which is a beautiful illustration of the brain engaged in this process of continually figuring out what is and what is not its body. So what happens in this, in this experiment is that the person's real hand is hidden from view and a fake hand is placed in front of them and then the experimenter strokes both hands simultaneously with a paintbrush. So the person is seeing a hand, which is, they know is not their hand, but it's roughly where a hand should be, looks like a hand. They're seeing it being touched and they're feeling touch at the same time. So this is quite a lot of evidence for the brain that even though it's not my hand, it kind of, it must be my hand. And if you do this for a while, you develop the uncanny sensation that this fake hand is in fact part of the body. And there are many ways to test this, but this is the only really good way to test it. Um, <laughs> Works really well on children as well, I found. But, um, so it works. You, know, you, can, you can convince the brain that you know, something as basic as what is our body is something that is, is malleable. And of course, many symptoms in following brain damage can... We see this frequently. People with phantom limb syndrome who've had limbs amputated will still feel the limb as being there. There's a, this, the mirror image of that is something called somatoparaphrenia, people whose limbs are still perfectly attached to their bodies, they experience them as not their limbs and desire their amputation. Um, and this can even, uh, you can do, you can extend this in many different ways. This is uh, Maxine and, and Rennie at the British, the Brighton, no, the British Science Festival last year. What you do here is you have people wear headsets with cameras and you swap the feed so that now this person sees themselves through that person's eyes and again, the key thing is when they shake hands, you get that multi-sensory congruence, which the brain takes as extremely powerful evidence. And suddenly you feel like you're shaking hands with yourself from within another person's body. It's a body swap illusion. You can even have out-of-body experiences. And I think there's a, you, know, you can look at yourself from behind and do the same sort of thing. And there's an important message here, which is that throughout the ages, people have reported things like out-of-body experiences and have often been sort of you know, poo-pooed by, by science. And this is wrong. People are having these experiences and they should be respected. But their explanations for these experiences should perhaps be not taken on board. It's not that your soul has left your brain as floating around. It's just that your brain has come to an unusual best guess 
about where its first-person perspective is located by purely natural um, means. Now, there's experiencing the body from the outside, there's also experiencing the body from within, and this is typically, you know, if you think about it, this is a very basic sense of selfhood that we all have, this experience of just being a body. And this highlights interoception, which is an overlooked way in which the brain perceives the world. This is the brain perceiving the internal state of the body. A large amount of neuronal real estate is dedicated to perceiving and controlling its internal state. If you think what brains are for, they're ultimately just for staying alive. They're for keeping the body and the brain alive. Perception of the world around just sort of follows indirectly from that. Um, so we wanted to know what the, the implication of this interoception, this perception of the body from within, has for our experiences of being a self. One thing we did was a version of the rubber hand illusion where now instead of stroking the hand with a paintbrush, it flashes in time or out of time with your heartbeat. And what we find is when it flashes in time with your heartbeat, you perceive it more as part of your body. So our experience of what our body is, is governed not only by signals from outside the body, but signals that are coming from deep within the body. Even if you're not aware of when your heart's beating, it's still influencing your perceptions of what is your body, what is yourself. Um, this looks like this, in a, you know, you do this in VR again now, so here's somebody's hand. It's a bit jaggedy because it's quite old, um, and it flashes to red and back very gently. So our experiences of what our body is is also a kind of controlled hallucination, and that leads to the third kind of take-home message that with apologies to Descartes, you know, I don't think, therefore I am, I predict myself, therefore I am. Now, the last point I want to mention is also about Descartes, and it's really this idea that, that um, for Descartes, the fact that we're made of flesh and blood was rather irrelevant to the presence of consciousness or soul. You know, Descartes was keen for various reasons to reserve consciousness for humans. And so, you know, if animals bleed when you, you know, when you cut them, that doesn't mean they have any kind of conscious awareness. Now, I rather think this line of thinking is taking us to the opposite point of view, that we have conscious selves, we are conscious not in spite of, but because of we are living flesh and blood organisms. Because the whole reason for having this predictive machinery that enables perception is fundamentally about regulation and control of the internal state of the body. Um, so thinking again about perception as this reduction of prediction error, we can either change our perception, or another way of reducing prediction error is to change the sensation, to, to make an action to change what we perceive. You know, if I'm expecting to see a friend and I don't see that friend, I can either update my, percep my prediction, or I can go, in to where, you know, go to my friend's house and verify my prediction that way. So I can make actions to make predictions come true. Even when I just move my hand, what I'm, another way to think of this is I'm fulfilling a prediction about where my hand ought to be. It's a self-fulfilling proprioceptive prediction. So doing this enables us to control. If I predict that my heart rate stays within certain range, it will stay there, so long as I use actions to make sure that prediction comes true, rather than just update the prediction. Predictions can regulate. And so here's the, here's the last idea, which is that interoception, perception of the body from within, is not really about figuring out what's there. It's about controlling and regulating the internal state of the body. And this explains something, I think, about the difference between the way we perceive the world and the... When I perceive the world around me, it seems full of objects and the spaces between them. Talked about objects already. But the body, I don't perceive my internal organs in different places. You know, I don't perceive being a body as a kind of object. I just perceive it as something that's either going well or going badly. And I think this has to do with the different ways the brain is using predictions. When the brain uses predictions for control, we experience how well or how badly that control is going. When we use predictions to figure out what's there, we experience objects and things as the contents of our perception. So we can begin to really explain properties of phenomenology now in terms of different kinds of mechanisms. Um, and this is related to a bunch of other frameworks by Lisa Barrett and Carl Friston, um, and is not what Descartes said. But back to that point that conscious selfhood emerges because of and not in spite of the fact that we are what Descartes and Julien Lemaitre call beast machines. There's very close ties between mind and life. Um, and this just makes the point that if 
that's the origin of our perceptual mechanisms, then everything we perceive, whether it's things out there in the world or things in our body, are all grounded in these same basic predictive mechanisms that have their roots, origin, and ultimate explanation in keeping the body alive. We perceive the world around us because of our living bodies, with them, through them, and because of them. So, summarise the whole thing. Back to conscious level, it's a complex balance in neural dynamics of information or differentiation and integration. Conscious content is the brain's best guess of the causes of its sensory input. And conscious self is, I think, very closely tied up with the fact that we are living organisms whose internal physiology requires predictive regulation from moment to moment. And I'll leave you with three implications of all this. And just, I won't go into them, but just leave them out there for discussion. One is psychiatry. By understanding perception's prediction, we can start to get a handle on how perceptual experiences differ in pathological and distressing cases in psychosis, depersonalization, schizophrenia, depression, and so on. We can begin to develop a mechanistic understanding and transition in medicine from just suppressing the symptoms to actually getting at the underlying causes. So I think this has a lot of implications for psychiatry. Second thing is just consciousness is not just a matter of being smart. We tend to think it is because we, we tend to think we're smart and we're conscious. And you see this these days in the current discussions about artificial intelligence. The idea that as you make things smarter, they will at some point become conscious and maybe then take over the world. There's this weird association of intelligence with, with consciousness. I think much more important is the association between consciousness and life. Now, you don't have to be smart to suffer, but you probably do have to be alive to suffer. So we should be much more concerned, I think, about the potential for suffering in other living systems rather than the potential for developing a particularly smart AlphaGo player that is suddenly going to um, enslave the rest of us. And finally, the idea of consciousness and conscious self as a construction tells us that our way of experiencing the world and our way of experiencing a self is just one way out of many possible ways one might experience selfhood. You know, I experience my body as an object, but that's because I have particular kind of sensory channels and make particular sensory inferences. The octopus has um, three hearts, completely flexible arms, can taste with its skin. Uh, its experience of being a self, if there is one, is going to be radically different from ours. There's a vast space of possible minds, and we inhabit just one small region of that vast space. I can't resist showing you this video of the amazing camouflage abilities of an octopus. Can you see the octopus? You will. It's there. Um, they have extraordinary camouflage ability. Um, and so, you know, what, what's, what's their experience of being an embodied organism like? Um, it's really phenomenal. So, you know, with, I think, all these, these advances in understanding ourselves, you know, they, they play into this bigger narrative that, you know, um, whether it's understanding our place in the universe, whether it's understanding our relation to other forms of life, and now with our understanding of consciousness in terms of brain activity, with each of these developments, I think they're helpful, they're, they're, they're kind of illuminating and enlightening because they allow us to see ourselves less as apart from nature as sitting on top of it somehow and different from it and more as continuous and a part of the rest of the natural world and if there's one message in general that science conveys it's that we are part and parcel of the natural world and not separate from it and when the end of consciousness comes well there is nothing at all to be afraid of so thank you very much <laughs>
Can you speak up a bit? I, um, sorry. That's uh, better. Am I audible? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the uh, great session. Um, all right. The basic question I have here is, uh, from the neuroscience uh, perspective, do you have any explanation why a human brain is in common, uh, like to be more lazy, and why it takes an extraordinary effort for him to put through the uh, cycle uh, to become more active? Why are we all lazy? Yeah. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Um, no, I, I, I don't know. I, I, am, I empathize uh, greatly. Uh, it's, it's, I, I actually think we were pro as a, as a slightly different thing. I mean, I didn't see the other talks, but my sort of take on this is we were designed, this is called an evolutionary psychology answer, we were probably designed to be quite lazy. Um, it's only a real sort of creation of modern society over the last two or three hundred years that non-laziness has become important <laughs> and so it's no surprise that, that we struggle I think it's just not what not what we the environment we were built for um, that's guess oh somebody begs to differ that's fine yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi there. Um, yeah so the whole control and uncontrolled yeah that's working the whole controlled and uncontrolled hallucination stuff like Love it, very matrix. Um, <laughs> so, um, in terms of, so I was doing this exercise the other day. It was um, an imagination exercise mm -hmm. where you sort of you imagine an object and you change the colour of your object with your imagination. Mm -hmm. So you go through, you go red, orange, you know, blah blah, blah through colours and spectrum. Mm -hmm. What's going on with like how do we generate that image mm -hmm. and? Like what's going on, the mechanisms of the brain to mm. that. It's a good question. I mean, I don't know that exercise, but that sounds very interesting. So, you, do you actually perceive the object as changing in colour, though? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, active imagination. So yeah. yeah. I mean, the first thing to take from that is there's a lot of overlap between mental imagery and visual perception. You know, they're, they're leveraging the same sorts of circuits. You can think of imagery as just this sort of imposition of predictions and trying to ignore as much as possible the sensory data, you know, why for most people it's easier to engage in vivid mental imagery with your eyes closed, um, because then you don't have all this disconfirmatory evidence straight away. It's interesting that you can actually, in, in your case, overcome that anyway. Um, you know, we've seen this in some examples with synesthesia where we can, or hypnosis, where we can get people to perceive things differently uh, through training or through hypnotic uh, um, modulation. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the same mechanism. There's also, there's also a number of people who, a, a state called aphantasia, so a non-significant fraction of people just don't have mental imagery at all, and they, don't know, they wouldn't know what you were talking about when they say, um, you know, it, I can imagine this object with this colour. It, it's sort of, for a large number of people, it, they just don't do it. But they still see. That's the mystery there. They, their perception isn't, doesn't seem to be uh, affected, at least not in any obvious ways. Hmm. Uh, I mean, where is it in evolution? Yeah, we're all the same distance uh, on the evolutionary tree from, from the start. Um, so, you know, I tend to, to resist. So the evolution of that, you can think of one of the, the things about the evolution of the brain, that there was a period of rapid expansion of the brain. Um, and this is sort of reflected in the fact that if you look at different parts of the brain under the microscope, they look pretty similar. So it's almost as if the expansion of the brain was just, you know, replicate the same functional circuitry, plug different sensory inputs and things into it, and you'll get different capabilities. So there has been, you know, there was a rapid expansion of, of brain size, which then became limited by birth canal and, and, and so on. And, um, and people argue about relative brain size in humans compared to other animals. There's a huge debate about Always, again, some people trying to point out that we're special somehow and we have bigger brains than you would expect on the basis of body size and all sorts of things. I, I tend to get a bit bored by these arguments. I mean, we, we have reasonably large brains, yes, but then there are so many ways of, of other things. You know, what proportion is devoted to the cortex versus other regions and, and um, the particular cell types that you see in human brains versus, versus other brains. One of the big mysteries here, I think, is that you know, 
our brains have, as far as we can tell, remained pretty much the same for quite a while over human history, yet our cultural environment has changed dramatically. And there are periods of human culture where people were basically making the same sorts of tools or decorative things, and didn't change for thousands of years. Um, the same, roughly, as far as we can tell, because you know, we don't have preserved, you know, we just know the, the kind of gross size. Uh, but you see vast cultural changes when you can assume relatively stable um, neurophysiological background. I don't know if that answers your question. I don't, I mean, what it means is that I think what brains do and how we experience the world around us is going to depend much more on the kinds of environments that we put brains into than on a, any further biological evolutionary change of the, you know, the neural material itself. There's some sense in which it's collective, in the sense that my experience of the world around me is very dependent on how I experience you, you experiencing it. So I, you know, I can't help but populate the world with other mental agents that I assume have conscious experiences. Now that's a sort of pretty deflationary way to think about collective consciousness. There are other slightly more spooky ways, which just says there's one kind of universal conscious being and we're somehow parts of... I, I don't, I think that to me is where we step out of what we can say with science and we become a bit more religious and metaphysical about it. You know, panpsychism is a, still a respected view in philosophy. I think it's a bit crazy because it's not testable, it's not even wrong, but there is a, you know, there's a way to defend the idea that consciousness is somehow present throughout the universe, that it has a similar status to sort of mass or, or energy um, or charge. Um, that's not to say that spoons think or perceive things the way we do, but that you know, whatever consciousness is at the most fundamental level is, is sort of everywhere. Now, I don't find this a particularly useful way to think because the world and what we would do with it basically looks exactly the same, whether you believe that or, or not. But from what we do know, I think that the, the substrate of consciousness is, is in the skull of an individual, but the way we experience the world around us is a very collective and a very social thing. I've lost track of who's, who's next. Okay. Um, hi. Um, I just wondered if you've done any research into um, consciousness in terms of a change in consciousness um, with regard to things like hypnosis and other altered or trance states. And also, um, seems to be quite topical at the moment in terms of opi opioids, how those states can be used to help with pain management. Control. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, good set of questions. I'm, my colleague at Sussex, Zoltan Dienas, has done a lot of work on both meditation and hypnosis. And I mean, the first thing to say there is that hypnosis is real. It's not just some sort of circus stage trick. You, you can, uh, you know, one in ten people roughly is highly hypnotizable. Um, and so you can, you, know, you can test this. And certainly you can induce via hypnosis changes in perception. Um, changes in volition and intentionality, so you can make people behave differently with actions that they make under suggestion compared to actions that they don't, and analgesia as well. So I know there's, I mean, I don't, not something I know terribly much about, but I find it completely plausible that through hypnosis you can uh, induce states of, of dissociation that are effective uh, for analgesia. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, Anil. Have you seen the news this weekend about the pigs' brains that have been oh, yeah. inside of a body? Like just extrapolating out from that decades or however, what do you think about the idea of having a consciousness that doesn't exist within our own minds that's either taken out of our physical body if we die or potentially? Turn into an electronic signal in a computer yeah, I, I, I mean, I've only seen the headlines about the pig brain in a dish thing, and and actually, I was wanting to look more into it because people were making these like, oh, of course, it's not conscious, um, and I kind of believe that, but I would want to know on what basis they're making that, you know, that that claim. Um, but sort of extrapolating out from that, there's 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 one thing which I think is probably not going to happen, or at least not people shouldn't assume that it's sort of an inevitable direction we're going, which is this idea that we can upload our consciousnesses to a computer or to the cloud at some point. Um, because 
in that assumption is, is a further assumption that consciousness is something that can be simulated. Uh, that it is something that one can, that is just purely a property of the functional organization of a system and is not dependent on the substrate. There's a sort of substrate independence. Now this may be true, but it's a very, very strong assumption. And I think it's, a day, it's one that people take on board far too easily uh, because they're sort of overwhelmed by the power of computers. Uh, and computers really are general purpose simulation systems. So we, we simulate weather systems in computers. Nobody expects it to get windy or wet inside a com computational model of a weather system, however detailed that uh, simulation is. Um, yet a simulation of something that plays chess is actually playing chess. Uh, so where is consciousness on this? We don't, I don't really know, but I see no reason to think that it's something that we can be sure is something that can be simulated. And I would not be signing myself up to, you know, uploading myself to, to the cloud because I think at most you'll get a simulation of what it is to be. At minimum, you need to recapitulate the causal mechanisms. Whether you, do that, whether you can do that of something other than neurons, I don't, I don't know. I actually think the more pressing concern will be exactly the, the, if you like, hybrid things, this line of research by these pig brains. We, we, you know, we will be able to grow uh, more and more sophisticated uh, neural systems, uh, body, you know, things artificially, um, but that are made out of neurons and real biological stuff. I think then there's, there's definite uh, cause for concern and the ethics needs to get out ahead of, of that in a way that it probably hasn't yet. Fascinating lecture, thank you very much. Um, you had three main areas there. Um, the level of consciousness, the consciousness of content, and then the self, right? If you could eliminate the last two, so self-awareness and awareness of reality, can there still be any level of consciousness at all? Probably not. Yeah, I don't think they're completely independent. Uh, there's, yeah, I, it's, it's difficult to imagine what that would be. I think in some sense, conscious level probably boils down to the range of conscious contents that you have, encompassing self. As, I think you don't have to have self-consciousness. So that, you know, I think getting back to some sort of trance and meditative states, try to reach states of consciousness where one does, loses at least some of the aspects of conscious self, um, uh, certainly some of the more abstract ones. But yeah, I don't, I don't think it would make sense to say that you can have conscious level independently of any content. And could, you, could you have the opposite? So could you not have consciousness? Again, probably not. I think, I think they're, 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 they're related. I think, the, the purpose of distinguishing them was more to, to show that you, 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 at this point you'd use different frameworks and different methods to, to study them. But for instance, the fact that we applied these measures of level to the psychedelic state shows that a measure of level is in this case sensitive to a relatively global change in conscious content. You know, people don't fall asleep or lose it when they're in, under LSD, but their global conscious contents are changing, and we pick that up with a measure of level. So I think the... the the interesting way to f progress that is to ask, well, what are, the, how, what are the relations? You know, how can content vary and yet we still call it a, an unchanging level? You know, um, questions like that would be useful. Mm. So there's this whole history from the 50s of these split brain operations which were done uh, mainly for, again, epilepsy. So you cut the brain in half, you stop the spread of epileptic activity throughout the whole brain. So these operations were called callosectomies, severing of the corpus callosum. The amazing thing was people pretty much behave the same after having their brains chopped in half. Um, <laughs> compared to beforehand, and it takes some subtle experiments where, again, you show different uh, 
hemispheres different images and then you suddenly see divergences between uh, what, what happens and typically one hemisphere is in control of language. Language is one of the few functions in the brain that is often reliably lateralized to the left hemisphere. So if you show something in, to the right eye of a split brain patient, they will be able to verbally tell you what it is. But if you show something to the left eye, so it goes to the right brain, they won't tell you what it is if you ask them, but they will, will still be able to point to it with their left hand. And, so, and if you show two different images, then you can start to get situations where the right brain seems, or the left brain seems to be saying one thing, the right brain seems to be pointing at something else, which leads to the idea that there are two separate conscious subjects within a single cranial container. Um, the odd thing about these experiments is that almost all that's been written about them was written on the basis of a relatively few case studies, mainly done in the 60s and 70s, 50s. Um, and as split brain operations became less common, you know, it's become harder to, to go at these studies with the rigor that one would apply nowadays when you're doing experiments on perception. There's a group in, in Holland which have been doing this, and they found actually the situation is not as simple as two um, separate things. Basically, if you have a stimulus appear anywhere, a split brain patient can point to it wherever it is. So they're sensitive to a whole visual field. But what they can't do is integrate information that crosses the midline. So if perceptual decision depends on a stimulus, half of which is going to one hemisphere, half of which is going to the other, they will encounter problems making a decision about that stimulus. So it's as if they have um, sort of one awareness, but two separate areas of integration of perception. I don't know what it would be like to be a split brain patient, it's still unanswerable, but it's not as simple as that. The other sort of fascinating mirror image of that is what's called craniophagal twins. So these are twins whose brains are melded together, so it's the opposite of a split brain. Um, and you know, this obviously happens very rarely and, and often most don't survive, but in a couple of cases you find interesting situations where one twin is able to taste what another twin eats. Um, and so again, are there two separate individuals or two separate and one superordinate individual or what? Doesn't, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but it's, it's perplexing. So can, may I just ask, does your uh, research uh, include ESP phenomena? No. no. Because they don't exist. Sorry? Because ESP phenomena don't exist. So um, we don't. No. There's no evidence for it. Um. <laughs> right. Well, in that case, hmm? I don't believe your lecture. Okay, fine. <laughs> Say again? Were you continuing or are we joined to an uh, It's up to you. I'm happy to. I think people are probably uh, running out of energy, but. Um, Yeah, yeah, I've never really understood what they meant by that. I mean, a hologram is a way of embedding a 3D structure on a 2D plate so that you can, it, it seems, I always took it by some analogy to try to get a handle on how we understand the topology of the brain in three dimensions. Um, uh, beyond that, I don't really know. It may have other analogies in terms of how you can recreate, let's say, a memory by probing a neural circuit with activity in different ways and regenerating some topological form. But, but it's, it's sort of, yeah, you're right, it's a, it's a phrase that I remember, and it's sort of, I haven't heard it very recently, so I don't, I'm not sure it has any, any particular legs. I, I thought it was in relation to the distribu distribution of information, that, that if you lost a bit of brain, ah, right. you could reconstruct. Yeah, no, that, so, yeah, that, that may be more to it. So. A gentleman at the front says, I think, very rightly that a, a better use of that term is the ability to reconstruct the whole from parts, even when part, some parts may be missing, so that the information is kind of distributed in a, in a way across a network that's resistant to disruption of, of its parts, which, yeah. It's, again, it's a sort of by analogy, isn't it? But it's, um, but it's a, probably a more informative one than the one I said. Yeah. Okay, I think um, that's it. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>